better explain right from the outset that when it comes to technology, I am hopeless. <laughs> I stare at this computer screen wondering how on earth it did that, why it did that, how I can stop it doing that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and yet, uh, my career has been dictated by technology in a way which I didn't realize until I started to look back. I had the huge luck. Uh, I, I applied for a job in radio and was turned down without any uh, question of even an interview back in 1950, 51. Um, and, um, and then the BBC wrote and said, uh, would I be interested in a new thing that they've got going up in North London? Uh, a lot of people thought it wouldn't come to anything, but they thought there was something in it. It was called television. Would I like to join? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. Uh, and we went, I went up to Alexander Palace, uh, and there are two studios, neither of them as big as this next to them. Uh, and all the television from British, in Britain came from those two studios, so nothing else. Uh, and it was all live. And uh, so and the cameras we used were the cameras which were the first cameras in the world, not, not the model, the actual thing, the bit of metal and glass and valves, that was the actual thing which had produced the first public television in the world. And they were, of course, extraordinary clumsy. They were mounted on bicycle wheels, they only had one lens, uh, they required a great deal of light, um, and uh, that was what we used. And uh, there were only about half a dozen of us who were concerned with producing every kind of non-fiction television program that we put them out. I mean, I produced programs on knitting, <laughs> <laughs> cooking, politics, urban design, and in the course of travel, and then a bit on natural history. And was lucky enough, as television grew, to uh, find myself becoming more and more involved in natural history. Um, and I'm happy to say that those programs had uh, live components in them, so they cannot be seen by anybody. They were terrible. I mean, they were very crude and simple, but I loved them all. And, uh, and then in the 60s, I became an administrator in the BBC, uh, and then uh, I left the BBC to go back to make programs. Uh, and by this stage, television had increased uh, technically, advanced technically, to an extraordinary degree. I, we had, it wasn't yet in colour, it was in black and white, but I was in a, in a, no, that, I, when I went there, I had something to do with the introduction of colour television. Then when I left, uh, there was this machine which was going to be able to record animals and plants in a competent way, unparalleled up to that time. And there was another odd thing, which is quite coincidental, looking back, I realized. And that was for the first time in 1973, <coughs> jet aircraft could take you anywhere in the world predictably, and not too expensively. And so for the first time, it was actually feasible <coughs> for a producer to say, I'd like to do the series, 13 programs, in which we will go to every part of the world. And we will be able to schedule it absolutely perfectly, so that we'll be able to get land here and take this and then move off and go and do that. So uh, I suddenly thought, now for the first time, you're going to be able to, I'm going to be able to show the whole range of the natural world. Uh, and I sat down and I wrote, um, didn't take very long, uh, any, any biological uh, teacher here could do the same. I wrote 13 uh, programs about the history of the animal world. 